Hi, everyone. Um, if you just join us, uh, I'm in the Intelligent Apps track. My name is Venga Taylor. I'm a manager of social architecture at Red Hat. So our next session is titled Supersonic Model Serving Using Deep Java Library, or DJL, and Quarkus. So honestly, I'm really excited to introduce you to our next speakers who have worked closely uh, for the past three years. Our lead speaker is Jeff Bride. He is a senior principal specialist solution architect at Red Hat, and he specializes in cloud native dev and integration. We also have David Marcus here. He's an associate principal specialist SA, and he's also a data science lead in North America. So in this session, Jeff will introduce you to supersonic model serving in a cloud native environment using the power of DJL embedded in Quarkus. Now, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments, right? And if we have time, we'll have a live Q&A session as, uh, at the end. Um, as always, all sessions and recordings will be uploaded to the Red Hat Developer YouTube page, and the presentation will be made available later. Jeff, please take it away. All right, thank you, Benga. And uh, thank you all for joining us in this session for about the next 45 minutes. Um, I will mention that uh, certainly uh, everybody is welcome, uh, but my uh, intended audience really for this, for this uh, discussion is really to our, our enterprise Java DevOps shops that have spent the last couple of decades investing in expertise running uh, Java applications in production environments. Uh, and they want to accelerate uh, any initiatives that they might have of using um, uh, data science machine learning uh, opportunities on those Java um, applications or co-located with those Java applications. Um, so that's where it's probably going to get interesting for you. So we're going to talk about Amazon's Deep Java Library initiative. We're going to talk about Quarkus and what I think is the power of, of the two of them combined. Um, but let me start with Amazon's initiative, um, just as a from an intro perspective. So Amazon has this open source initiative called Deep Java Library, and they are using it uh, both internally and for also uh, for customer um, requests and requirements that they get uh, for uh, model serving of, of in supporting their data science projects. Um, they're using it very successfully, it seems like, and being that it's open source, uh, other Java shops um, have uh, picked up on this and are also using the Java library. So the next statement here uh, I feel is, is quite important, um, is certainly a, a, an enormous value proposition. And that's the unified uh, Deep Java library brings a unified Java API wrapper of the most prominent C++ based deep learning engines. So just a level set here, uh, when we talk about um, these deep learning engines, we're talking about things like PyTorch and MXNet and TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, so on and so forth. There's lots of them. And from a performance and optimization for performance and optimization reasons, uh, these deep learning engines are predominantly written in C and C++, right? And so how do other frameworks uh, such as Python and Java uh, get to take advantage of those C++ libraries? Well, Python, as an example, is uh, writes a wrapper around those C++ libraries um, and is able to interact with those those deep learning engines. Java does the same thing. Um, historically, going way back, Java has the Java native interface or the JNI interface uh, for interacting with C++-based uh, applications. And so that's what we have. We have JNI wrappers around these uh, C++ uh, deep learning engine libraries similar to Python. So those already exist. Now, what Deep Java Library does from Amazon is uh, a couple of things. It sort of unifies or, or brings together all of those JNI wrappers for all of those different deep learning engines 
and abstracts the details and the idiosyncrasies of those deep learning engines and instead provides a single uh, intuitive Java API, a Java-based API, that someone like myself, who's not a data scientist, you know, I'm traditionally a, a Java business application developer, well, I can standardize on that DJL unified, simplified Java API for like 80% of my use cases, right? And at least get me started with, uh, with, with uh, serving uh, models at runtime. Um, so that's super powerful. And then if and when need be, right, I can interact more directly um, with the, a, a specific deep learning engine, let's say TensorFlow, if and when need be. But the default is that I'm working with this, with this uh, very nice Java abstraction that DJL provides. It makes me much more, uh, much, makes me much more efficient and productive than if I had to learn each engine individually, All right? So my learning curve is, is uh, dramatically uh, reduced. And then as I mature in my expertise of, of data science, well, in the future, then I can go and dig into the other engines um, more specifically if I want to. Uh, as a user of DJL uh, here at Red Hat, I have found that uh, their open source community is, is very well supported, it's, it's very active. They've got great documentation. They have an entire book on using Deep Java Library for data science and their forums are, are great. So all of my questions have been answered um, through these community, uh, these community forums. So it's been great. So Deep Java Library, um, in my opinion, the real value is from the ability to serve models in Java. Uh, that's where this that's where I've been using DJL, and that's where I'm going to focus on. But just so that you're aware, uh, the Deep Java Library also has uh, tooling that supports pre and post processing data manipulation and model training. So these lad latter initiatives. Um, data manipulation and model training traditionally are done uh, in Python uh, or, or something equivalent that data scientists are comfortable with. Uh, but just know that if you're interested, you can also do this in Java using DJL as well. And so from a, a target environment of where your, your model serving is going to run, uh, basically, um, the sky's the limit in terms of options that you have. Uh, certainly your, your Java model serving initiatives using DJL are gonna run great in a cloud environment. Um, so here I, I'm speaking specifically to Red Hat's OpenShift platform. Um, I've used that extensively and it, it works great. Another use case, another target environment is running your model serving at the edge co-located with uh, the data ingestion point that the predictive analysis of your model is, 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 uh, is analyzing on. And so this, this use case, the edge use case uh, is intriguing to me. And so that I'm actually gonna use that um, as, the, as my demo here uh, in a few minutes. So I'll talk more about that later. Uh, and being that uh, Deep Java Library is Java, uh, runs great on your Android mobile platform as well. So speaking of use cases, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Amazon has done a very nice job of blogging uh, of, about all the various use cases that they've encountered, um, customer use cases and internal use cases on their blog site. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go through all the details over here. I've, I, I've kind of cherry picked their blogs and listed them here, um, but they're really interesting, um, very insightful. And so I encourage you to, uh, to go over to their blogs and, and take a look at how they're using the Java library uh, in production um, for model serving for a variety of use cases. So 
you know, one value proposition that I was mentioning about just earlier is the unified Java API um, certainly accelerates adoption of, of model serving to uh, non-data scientists like myself. So that's great. Another value proposition that I want to talk about, I want to mention from the context of uh, challenges uh, that uh, apparently uh, that apparently occur uh, in terms of data science itself. So, you know, I, again, I'm not a data scientist, um, but it's uh, become a, I've been made aware that uh, a real problem that still exists is that only a fraction of data science projects today are actually making it into production. And a colleague of mine, David, who's on the, on the, on the uh, presentation here, um, linked to me this article that I've provided on the, on the slide here. But it it's from 2019, but it, apparently the problem still exists where uh, a very low percentage of data science projects are actually making it into production. And the author of the article points out uh, one of the root issues is the disparity between the tooling and methodologies utilized by the data scientists um, and the mismatch and disparities with the tooling and methodologies that a traditional DevOps team um, utilizes. And so that's the problem. And it seems to me, in my, in my opinion, that Deep Java Library attempts to alleviate or totally address this issue um, by, by using the model, you can kind of think of it as the contract between the data scientists and the enterprise DevOps team. So the data scientist is going to use the tooling and methodologies that he or she is familiar with uh, to create a model and tra train the model, um, maintain that, that model over, the, over, over its life cycle. And then the traditional DevOps team is going to be able to serve that model at runtime using the expertise that they've developed over the course of the last 20 years, using the toolings that, tooling that they're already very familiar with because they're supporting many other Java uh, enterprise applications. And um, so hopefully, you know, that disparity between the two teams is alleviated. Okay, so the next thing I want to just highlight is um, from another value proposition perspective is that uh, so you know, running your models model serving um, in in python so i'm not a python expert but uh, anecdotally it's my understanding that uh, that um, under some circumstances python it's a little bit more difficult for python to uh, scale so it's my understanding that uh, with Python applications, um, it, with a C Python interpreter specifically, which apparently is the default um, Python runtime, uh, it's a little problematic to scale in that if you want a, an additional threat of execution, then you're gonna have to instantiate an entire new operating system process. And along with that, all of the RAM requirements to support that additional operating system process right um, so from a scalability perspective that becomes a little problematic now apparently there's some workarounds and some there's some alternative interpreters but uh, that seems to be the default experience that's not the case with uh, the java virtual machine uh, the java virtual machine is inherently multi-threaded uh, and um, so using the same key, you have, um, you know, uh, multiple threads of execution running through that same key, and subsequently the, the scalability of your JVM-based application is going to be much more linear, uh, much more stable. All right, so still keeping with uh, Amazon's Deep Java Library, from an architecture perspective, uh, one way that you can interact with Deep Java Library is through what they call the model server. And so this is a, you can think of it like a, a centralized traditional model, monolithic application. It's a web application. 
Uh, it actually happens to run on a framework known as Netty, which Red Hat is a, a long time contributor to. Uh, but it's this uh, monolithic uh, web server uh, that exposes a variety of different APIs, like a, a REST API and an asynchronous API. And uh, so remote clients interact with that centralized monolithic web server. Right? And so you feed this monolithic web server your, your model at runtime, and then uh, the, the deep learning engines that are embedded in the model server uh, will execute on that model at runtime, right? So you're not embedding it into your own application, you're interacting with that model server remotely, right? Being that it's all Java, um, you know, it's monolithic, but it runs great uh, on, on a Red Hat stack, no problem. Uh, in this diagram, I'm depicting it running on OpenShift. So it's a Linux container running on OpenShift um, and making use of the Red Hat stack. If your OpenShift is enabled with, with, uh, with GPUs and uh, corresponding NVIDIA libraries, then the DJL model server is going to auto detect the presence of those GPUs and run your model um, if you choose so on those GPUs. So uh, with that, um, let's now transition into talking about Quarkus, right? And so this is where I think it gets interesting, um, the combination of the Java library and Quarkus. So what is Quarkus? It is Red Hat's modern Java framework uh, for microservice and edge architectures. So it's something that we've been um, creating, supporting um, through a you know, traditional open source methodology uh, for about the last five years or so. And um, it's uh, just kind of the evolution of JE, uh, but for microservice and and, and edge, uh, modern microservice and edge use cases. <clears throat> One of the nice things about it is that uh, using Quarkus, um, if you're familiar with MicroProfile, if you're familiar with JEE, uh, you've come to lean on and expect a, a massive ecosystem of, of uh, enterprise features um, for basically everything you need to do in a, in a business in a business application, so reactive programming and uh, integrate, integrating with messaging and streaming uh, brokers, uh, integration, in enterprise patterns um, using Camel as an example, and exposing APIs using REST and SOAP, and integrating with single sign-on as an example, so so on and so forth. Um, all of that is brought into the Quarkus framework and do, done so in a, in a simplified, unified API. Um, so it's really nice to work with. It's very intuitive to work with. Uh, if, you've, if you're a traditional JE, JE developer, uh, but, but are looking to get into uh, microservices or, or edge. Uh, being that it's a modern Java framework, it needs to run as a first class citizen in a Linux containerized environment. And so there's a whole suite of tooling within Quarkus to fast track you from your Java, your Quarkus Java application into a, a containerized environment. So that's really nice to work with. And subsequently, uh, in terms of container orchestration, uh, there's a whole suite of tooling, again, to get you from your, your Linux container, which embeds your Quarkus app, now into OpenShift itself. All right. In the context of Quarkus, you'll also often hear the term developer joy, and that actually means something. Um, the, the APIs uh, that uh, Quarkus exposes are very well thought out, uh, very intuitive uh, for Java developers. And again, the tooling uh, is going to make you very productive. Um, so I think you're going to enjoy working with Quarkus um, under all scenarios if you're a Java developer. From an architecture perspective where we bring together 
Deep Java Library and Quarkus. Uh, this uh, depicts uh, a microservice architecture. Um, and I think this is where things start to get pretty interesting. So in this slide, what I'm depicting is a series of uh, business applications that are Quarkus based, so they're Java based. And within each one of these Quarkus applications, I am embedding the Deep Java library as well as the corresponding uh, uh, deep learning engine into my business application. So I'm not, uh, my, my business application is not interacting remotely with a centralized model server, as I was kind of depicting in a couple, a couple slides earlier. Instead, I'm embedding the library, uh, the, 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 the model and the learning engine directly into my business application, right? Um, in a very small footprint. And I'm running so as a microservice, right? And so I have the options of um, a, a variety of different engines that I can embed in my business application and I'm containerizing them and subsequently uh, orchestrating all those containers uh, just as I would normally do uh, for any other uh, Java Linux containerized application on, on OpenShift. Um, so it's running on the Red Hat stack. And uh, similarly to previous, if I've enabled my, my OpenShift with GPUs uh, and the corresponding NVIDIA libraries, then my embedded microservice applications are going to auto detect the presence of those GPUs and actually run on those GPUs. Um, so I can take advantage of that as well. So that's a microservice uh, architecture where DJL is embedded directly into Quarkus. Uh, as opposed to the centralized approach that I was mentioning earlier. So another use case architecture that I find interesting uh, is the edge use case. Uh, and this is actually what I'm going to demonstrate here momentarily. Uh, but similarly, I've got my, my Quarkus uh, application uh, embedded with the deep Java libraries and deep Java uh, engines and the model uh, embedded into some type of Internet of Things device. And uh, it's it, that that device is co-located at the point of data ingestion. So the predictive analysis is done right where the data is at. And then ideally uh, streaming of state change as as they occur. So I'll speak to that here in a second. Um, so the edge device, um, similarly, I mean, uh, probably going to be containerized if you choose to do so, I mean, you could just run on a, on a JVM on the device if you, if, 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 if that's what you prefer. Um, but most often we're going to run in a Linux container and, uh, you could also optionally run it on micro shift, um, if you choose to do so, uh, which is kind of a, a, a a smaller footprint OpenShift framework for, for edge devices. Uh, if your edge device is enabled with GPUs and the NVIDIA libraries, then you're going to be able to pick up uh, on those GPUs and leverage those GPUs just in the other, similar to the other architectures as well. So let me spend a few minutes going through my demo. Uh, again, I could have picked a variety of use cases um, certainly anything cloud-based where the predictive analysis is running on the cloud. Uh, we've got several demos of Deep Java Library Corpus doing exactly that. Um, but for this presentation, I decided to, to, to demonstrate kind of the edge use case. So let me show you that. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll show you the, the, my, my device here in a second. Uh, but uh, this, this demo is what a, it, it's, uh, pertains to uh, live object detection. So you've probably seen these uh, types of demos before where predictive analysis is done on video frames and it detects the presence of different objects um, in, in real time. So 
I call this demo my intelligence at the edge demo because the prediction, so the model serving uh, and the prediction uh, analysis of, of the engine on the model and the video frame is happening at the edge. And my Quarkus application where the model uh, is embedded into uh, is, is acting on state change events. Right? And so all that analysis is being done at the edge. And then when a state change occurs, uh, that, that event and only that event is sent over the network um, to, to the cloud. You know, edge devices are typically operating in disconnected, intermittent, low bandwidth environments. So it's often the case that you don't want to be just like randomly, you know, streaming video frames. Um, you just want to stream the actual event itself. So that's what this demo is doing. Um, just so you're aware, uh, I'm going to be using the PyTorch engine um, and, uh, and, and Deep Java Libraries, uh, Unified API. Uh, the model that I'm going to be using is from Deep Java Libraries, what they call Model Zoo. Um, so I'm just using an off-the-shelf model. I haven't I haven't modified it myself um, or optimized it at all. <clears throat> all of this is going to be running in Quarkus uh, on a Raspberry Pi uh, four, and uh, so it's the ARM architecture. And on my Pi four, I have Fedora 38. Okay, so all that's happening on my Raspberry Pi when a state change occurs. I'm going to transmit the event via a, uh, MQTT uh, to my OpenShift environment, where um, uh, uh, the the MQTT event um, gets gets uh, persisted into a queue uh, maintained by my Red Hat AMQ broker, and then I have a simple Quarkus application. Uh, that consumes that event and streams that to my browser uh, via uh, what's known as uh, service sent events. Okay, so let's take a look at that now. All right, so what I want to do next is so this is going to be my this is going to be my a uh, very simple web application that's running up in OpenShift. And here in a second, you should see video frames of myself uh, from the webcam that's that's on my, my Raspberry Pi. So this is gonna be the, uh, the, the web app. And now let me navigate here over to my Pi 4 itself. So. Okay, so what I've got here in front of me, and hopefully you can all see this, is uh, a standard Raspberry Pi 4. Um, I've got an Ethernet cable connected to it so that it can stream my MQTT events as it detects some type of state change. Uh, I've got power running to it, and I've got this uh, webcam connected to it. Uh, the webcam is currently off because my application is not running on the Pi 4, right? So that's basically the, the hardware that I'm using. And so here in this terminal, I am, I am uh, shelled into my Pi 4. Um, so I'm on my laptop and I'm shelled into my Pi 4. And I've got my application uh, that I've previously written, written uh, in Quarkus and Deep Java Library, and uh, it's got a little bit of smarts to be able to detect some some state changes. So I'll kick this off, and it will take just a second here to kick uh, to start up. But you should see here in a second that the uh, as it starts up, my webcam should turn on, and it will begin to. Uh, yep. So there it goes, turns on a green light. And we should see now that it's uh, streaming state change events. Yeah, there we go. Uh, state change events as it picks them up. 
uh, and uh, streaming them to my cloud-based web application uh, when when need be. So if I kind of turn around the or turn the the webcam around, you can see you get an intimate look of my my work environment, my home, um, and uh, so that's it. Uh, so this is model serving using Deep Java Library and Quarkus on a remote uh, on a Raspberry Pi, and then forwarding state change events uh, as they occur to the cloud. So let me go back and now turn this off so it doesn't distract me. And let's continue on with the presentation. Okay. Okay, so just a few more slides and we'll do a quick Q&A uh, on just a few technicalities about Deep Java Library and Quarkus. So I was, uh, I was mentioning earlier um, the C++ libraries uh, that uh, exist for a variety of deep libraries deep learning engines and uh, how they're implemented primarily in C and C++. And I just want to mention that Amazon's Deep Java Library maintains um, pre-built jar files of the JNI wrappers for uh, most of the common triplets that you would encounter. So by triplets, I mean the combination of runtime or the, the combination of processor and operating system and desired machine learning engine that you choose at runtime. So there's wrappers for all those different types of triplets and the Amazon DJL community uh, maintains those for us. So that's uh, super nice to have. Uh, they're, uh, they, those JNI wrappers are, are embedded in or included in jar files and if you really wanted to poke around in your application um, that's using DJL, you would see that uh, for this particular triplet, triplet, in this case, TensorFlow, you'd see and be able to find that specific uh, JNI wrapper um, and, and engine that was, that was used at runtime. So in terms of using the C++ libraries, and getting them into your application, um, either in a microservice architecture or in, a, in an edge scenario like I just showed, uh, you have a couple of different options. The first one is you can uh, your application can auto detect the needed triplet or the needed um, set of engines uh, that are needed based on the model, and so that's kind of a nice uh, that's a nice feature that DJL provides. Um, at runtime, you feed it a model and it'll auto detect uh, what's the best engine to run that model. And so for quick starts and demos and getting started scenarios, that's super convenient. Now that's often probably not the case. It's probably not ideal uh, to run in a real production environment. Um, so oftentimes, you know, because production environments, we're typically talking about you know, they're, they're locked down and so Alternative, what you can do is you would decide up front uh, which a triplet you basically you need for your runtime environment. And then you would specify that dependency for that exa exact triplet in your, you know, your, your Maven pom.xml um, at build time. And so that, that triplet, um, that, J that specific JNI wrapper uh, gets embedded into your application, uh, and so you know you're not you're not dynamically determining this at runtime and pulling down libraries. Uh, instead, it's already built into your application. So that's probably going to be the more secure uh, approach uh, when working in production environments. A few more notes about uh, Quarkus uh, and Linux containers. Uh, so just so you're aware, uh, Quarkus has a lot of tools uh, to support um, uh, getting your 
containerizing your Quarkus based application. Um, it's very simple to do so. You, as a Java application developer, you often uh, using Quarkus, you, you typically don't need to know uh, the mechanics of how to containerize your Quarkus application. Um, all you have to do is specify which approach you would like to take. Um, the, the default approach is using a pre-generated Docker file that comes when you create your Quarkus application. But there's some other approaches as well. And um, all of this is uh, made very easy uh, to not only create the Linux container, but also to push that to uh, a, a container registry um, in OpenShift and, and deploy. There are uh, a few parting notes. There are a few uh, alternatives to deep, uh, Amazon's Deep Java lining, uh, Learning, Deep Java Library Initiative. One of them is known as Deep Learning for J. Uh, I apologize, I don't know a whole lot about it, but just wanted to make uh, make you aware that uh, that there are alternatives. Um, it seems that I, I'm not sure that they have um, the unified API or at least it's not as mature as the one in, in Deep Java Library. Uh, so keep that in mind, but there are, there are folks using that. Uh, and here's a slide on a variety of other approaches um, where you, know, you, can use, uh, you can use Java to, to interoperate with, with a variety of different uh, uh, deep learning engines. Um, so there's alternatives to DJL. And as my final slide, just wanted to leave you with, with a few references uh, where you can learn a bit more if you're interested. So Benga and David, um, that's uh, all I have for now. Did we have any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, that was, that was really good. Uh, we had um, one question, but like uh, Dave Marcus responded, but oh. I'll, 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 I'll just repeat it here. Um, someone asked, what's the difference between using Python and Java in regards to multi-threading on GPU and CPUs for training models? And Dave like, like, responded with a bunch of links in the, in the chat, so that's there. Okay. And then the other question was, you know, does the same number of libraries in Python exist for Java, you know, like CNN, Transformers, and others? And Dave, uh, Dave responded with the libraries and engine supported by DJL the, with official documentation. Okay. So um, we have a couple of minutes. Do you have anything else to add? I, I... Uh, no, no, not at this time. I think Dave. Okay. Um, yeah. I do. I, I guess I do have one question. I was thinking while you were speaking. Um, so with a DJL, does the model get built into the Linux container at all? Well, you have, that's a good question. You have a, a couple of different options. Uh, you certainly can embed the model uh, if you choose to do so uh, into the application. Uh, it seems to me that you probably might not want to do that. Okay. Uh, instead, uh, it seems to me that uh, the model would exist outside of the application, outside of the Linux container, um, but co-located with it. Um, so, you know, as one example, you might mount the model to a persistent volume if you're running an OpenShift, uh, where the Linux container has access to that model, right? So it's mounted at runtime. And then the, the, the application in the Linux, the deep Java library application in the Linux container then loads the model from the persistent volume uh, into the application. So that's one approach you could take. You could also, um, you know, through DJL and Quarkus, you could pull from uh, a, a model repository that's, mm -hmm. that's uh, in the same is in the same environment um, in a secured manner. Uh, so that's another approach, um, you know, object storage of some sort, uh, whatever you choose. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think the nice thing about not embedding it, or it seems to me one of the nice things about not embedding the model in the Linux container is that uh, that 
that model can evolve uh, over time. And then as changes to the model happen, uh, they get reloaded into the application at runtime. So a variety of different approaches. Thanks for that, Jeff. Uh, so I think we're now out of time, but I guess, thank you, Jeff. That was a great uh, presentation and demo. Uh, so like I said before, all sessions recordings will be uploaded to the to YouTube page and presentations available made later. So our next session is a fun one with Dave Marcus. And uh, when, we, when we come back, it's, we'll have a session on active learning um, loop on OpenShift. So thanks everyone and see you later. Great job, Jeff.